All right, welcome in. It's the BCJ podcast here on BearcatJournal.com. We're gonna we're gonna try something a little different today. Uh, initiated by the fact that that Justin Williams has no internet, uh, so the only thing he's got is the the cell service on his phone. So we're we're gonna we're gonna zoom this thing today, and see how that goes. As you can see, we are joined by none other than the head strength and conditioning coach for the University of Cincinnati football program in Brady Collins. And we've uh, we've got a lot to discuss today. Justin, hello. Brady, hello. How are you guys doing? What's doing up, good, Brady? Man. Brady, is that your bedroom that, that you're in right now with the, with the weights behind you? This is where I, I love to sleep, yes. No, it's the, only, it's the only part of the house I feel like I can get a lot of work done with the kids. So I do all my meetings down here. I kind of feel normal and sane when I'm in my element of some sort. So it serves its purpose for sure. Brady, first off, Take me through this thing, man. How how are you guys staying in touch with everybody? How are you checking on, making sure that that you have guys in the condition that you want, that in the shape that you want, as you you work through self quarantining uh, in, in 2020? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's a very unique situation, but uh, you know, one that everybody in the whole country right now is going through. So. We as a program, personally, we feel really great about where we're at, um, where our guys are. You know, we've got track of where they're at, who they're with. Um, but, you know, really it all kind of happened right as spring break started for us. So I remember, you know, we finished our fourth practice and coach let the guys know, hey, you know, there's stuff going on. We don't know too much just yet. Just don't plan on rushing back here. We're going to communicate with you guys, this and that. And then obviously that's when the shutdown came and the quarantine and all that. And you know, the one good thing I could say just, you know, about coach and just everything that we do is we always have a plan for everything. So we're not just going to roll the ball out there and try to see if this sticks or make a schedule for this and try to stay stay to that because we all know stuff's going to happen. You got to roll with it. You got to adapt. And you got to have things that are going to help benefit not only you as a program, but obviously those kids, uh, you know, just personal lives as well. So, you know, that whole thing happened. Um, so coach and I, we got together, coach had a great plan with all his staff. I got with my staff. Um, obviously everybody is well versed now in these zoom meetings. Um, and obviously FaceTime and, you know, Twitter and Instagram and all those things. But, you know, we broke it down cause I'm so fortunate. I got four, you know, full-time assistants with me that it was almost like how we do the workout groups. We broke them, broke the guys down. I got these 25 guys. Coach Higgins has these guys, coach Foligno. Coach uh, Trip, Coach Ortiz, and then those are our daily guys that we check in on every single day. And, you know, we just mainly, we just want to see them like we would in the facility. Like, that's our biggest thing is relationships as a, as a program. And no doubt, we see those guys more than anybody, no offense to the coaches, but we just were around them so much during the year that we, you know, love to mess around with them, uh, know when they're feeling down, you know, just all these different types of things. And then when you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction every day, I mean, we miss it. Heck, yeah, we miss it. I know the kids do. And, you know, um, so that's the biggest thing we're doing right now is just daily communication, not harping. Because, again, we trust our guys. Like, you know, again, we feel fortunate just because of the, the culture and the environment that has been built, uh, the bond in that locker room that those guys have for one another. Um, but we just check in on them, you know. <clears throat> A lot of guys have access to a scale. Some don't. That's fine. Um, you know, so we try to keep up with their body weights, their nutrition, um, working with them, doing logs, just like if we were back here on campus, um, you know, we send workouts to them, which again, to me, I think it's crazy because, you know, you pull up any type of social media, you're going to see all types of workouts and, um, people are fitness gurus now, which is great. If anything, this quarantine is going to make the world, uh, work out some more, but, you know, I think one of the greatest things, um, that's really benefited our program is the workouts we're sending them they've done before so even though we're telling them okay whether you have access to equipment or you don't this is what you're going to do because when we first got this NC, we didn't have what we have now we had to work for it we had to earn it and so you know i've always joked with the guys i could i could train you with these two hands and a towel and you know they laugh but then they've done those exercises so they know and, you know, it's just all about being smart with it, um, understanding the timeline that we're in as well. I mean, you know, if everything wasn't the situation we're in right now, we'd be, you know, what, getting ready for the last week of 
spring practice, they're still in school, you're still training. Um, but, you know, you're also getting to that point, the end of April, a couple of weeks of May where they have off until we come back for the summer. So, you know, you're not trying to do too much from a, from an exercise standpoint. You're not trying to overload them. You're not trying to tax them too much. It's just keeping them in football specific conditioning. To me, that's the most important. If I'm, you know, Jeremy Cooper and Jakari Robinson, 310 to 320 pound guys, I don't want you going out running 40 yard sprints and hundred yards and gassers. I want you working on five to 10 yards, acceleration, strength, power, explosiveness, all those things. So um, again, we, we're, we're really fortunate just of the guys that we have and the plan that coach is putting together. Um, but it's, uh, it's been fun. It's been unique. Um, you know, we got guys, we have, you know, almost, I would say 30 guys that are still staying in Corey on campus. And that is huge because one, They've all been checked out by the medical staff to make sure everything's okay. Um, we're able to take care of them. The NCA allowed us to take over equipment for them to use that we use in the weight room. So those guys at Corey, they're doing really well. They, they got bars, they got bands, they got weights. Um, you know, we're able to get food for them, protein. We're able to ship protein to our players that are uh, off campus and out of state. And that's huge because, you know, one of the biggest things – and all of this that gets lost is the mental health aspect of, you know, your daily routine, your daily normalcy. You know, if I'm uh, a guy that comes in every day and I know I eat my breakfast and then I go get my pre, uh, you know, workout shake and then I'm going to work out and then I get my post-workout shake and I go to the training room, you know, all those things we're trying to simplify it and try to keep it as much as we can normal just from off, uh, off facility site. So you mentioned having a plan. Uh, obviously this isn't a situation like a global pandemic is not, it wasn't in the, uh, wasn't in the, in the top drawer file for Luke Fickle to pull out. Uh, yeah. How, how long did it take to, to come up with that? Was it during that spring break week where you guys really all kind of had a meeting of the minds and, and figured out this is what the plan is going to be? Yeah, I think, uh, I think coach caught wind of stuff that, you know, could potentially happen, um, probably midway through the last week of our spring practice that we were going right before spring break and uh, just, you know, kind of gave a heads up to, Hey, have something on the back burner here. You know, we might have, you know, an extended layoff at that time. Again, we had no idea if it was going to be a week a two week, we, you know, you have no idea. So it's kind of been one of those evolutionary plans in the beginning stages, but then it just, I mean, if there's anything coach Vic does besides attack and dominate and do the best he can to make everything the best for our program. I mean, that's what he's done. Um, you know, he got with all the coaches. They're attacking recruiting, obviously. They're, I mean, they're not missing a beat. Um, they're getting with their players a couple of times a week, doing their position meetings, um, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with our guys, seeing them on FaceTime, on Zoom meetings, all those things. And then, you know, it's he's basically operating like a, like a daily schedule inside the facility with staff meetings, uh, keeping the daily report with the training room, compliance us and uh you know it's just you feel really uh blessed and just you know you feel at ease because i feel like a lot of people in the country right now some programs they're kind of maybe not scrambling but just you know a little a little anxious a little maybe trying to do too much or not as and it's like if you have faith in the guys in that locker room i keep saying this this whole pandemic this whole quarantine however long it lasts I think it's going to separate the average, the good, and the great programs because everybody's going through the same thing. Everybody's going to have the same amount of time when we get back. What you do with that time is going to be so valuable, but also what you do with the time that you have with these kids on a daily basis is the most valuable thing as well. So the life lessons that we teach these kids that, you know, coach, coach instills in them, all the coaches, you know, how, how is that going to continue when you're not with them every single day? If your culture and your environment in that locker room is strong, it's going to continue. Uh, Brady, I was talking to Coach last week for a story I'm working on, and we were talking about just the different situations that each kid is in, whether it's do you have a ability to do meetings with, with internet? Do you have uh, an area to work out? Some guys have stuff in the basement. Some guys live in apartments and don't have that. He was talking about the strength guys that get on FaceTime and hey, take me through your house and show me yep. what you got. And, you know, you can stuff something in that backpack. So give me some of the more creative things you guys have had to do if somebody doesn't have weights or a weight room or, or even area to work out. Oh, yeah. And, uh, again, I'm blessed. I have four just really great young assistants that, you know, not only are just great strength coaches, but even better 
people. I mean, they all, we've all played college football. So again, you know, I think when, when you're coming up with even some unique at home workouts and they're coming from us, one, you know, we have great relationship with them and built the trust and respect, but also we're not just going to pull something out that we think is cool. It's going to be valuable to the sport that we play, which obviously is the most violent and aggressive and beautiful sport in the world football. So, you know, I think I can think of one, um, you know, where we grab some duffel bags and, you know, it's like, all right, you know, throw sand in it, throw gravel, throw whatever. And I think one of our players is like, coach, man, I don't have anything like that around me. And he's like, all right. He's like, I see a bookshelf behind you. Grab all those books, throw them in there. And he packed this, you know, duffel bag up of books and like went to, you know, pull it up. He's like, Dan, that's heavy. And we're like, yep, that's what we want. So it's, you know, it's, it's about being creative, which we pride ourselves on, especially um, in the weight room, but, but no doubt as a whole entire program of being creative, uh, but also working in the realm of being smart and obviously safe. Because <clears throat> the last thing you want to do is give a kid some type of workout or exercise modality that's going to hinder his athletic performance. Because, I mean, as much as I love, and I've always said it, you guys know it, big time weights and the squat fest and all that stuff, None of that stuff doesn't matter if they can't play football really, really well. You uh, you mentioned the creativity. Chad and I have been fortunate enough to see the squat fest insanity up close. We didn't you get mentioned... an invite this year. <laughs> oh, yes, you did. <laughs> you didn't tell us when it was. You were just like, you can come. And then next thing you know, <laughs> there's videos about squat fest. You never said what day no, or time. It's a select VIP last second invite, you know. Chad and I need, like, if it's going to be 6 a.m. or whatever it is, we need, like, two weeks' notice so we can <laughs> exactly. mentally prepare to be there for that. That is true. Uh, but you said that, like, you've always kind of been the creative guy. Every place you've been of trying to come up with ways to keep it exciting and not just feel like you're in a, a weight room lifting. W yeah. Where does that come from? Has that always been just part of your personality? Uh, I would say, yeah, I kind of think it is. I mean, if anybody's been blessed to see our TikTok tournament that we were in, you could kind of see a little <laughs> bit of the creativity there. Uh, although the wife was uh, really instrumental in the Joe Exotic video. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, I've always been kind of an outside-the-box thinker. Um, you know, my biggest thing has always been, you know, when I, when I was going to be a head guy, and I've learned from some of the best in the business. I mean, I've been so fortunate. My career path, I, mean, I would put up against anybody just because I've been so fortunate to work with so many great people. But, you know, you take pieces from all of them, and then you kind of mold yourself into what, you've learned what you've experienced and what you want to have in your environment. And, you know, to me, it's always been, yes, you know, for sure, you're going to work hard. If, if you're in this business and you're not working hard, just like in life, nothing, nothing's going to be handed to you. It's not going to be easy. And, you know, even as a general, as a program, you know, we ask so much of these kids, you know, you got to get up early, you got to come in, you got to check into breakfast, you got to work out, you got to uh, go get your treatment and rehab. You got to be at academics, uh, you know, tutoring on time and this, this, that all that stuff can get kind of crazy in their heads and stress them. The last thing I want for them when they're in the weight room is any type of stress besides the mental and physical stress that we're trying to inhibit and grow so that when they get on the football field, it's just natural. But, you know, I just try to always think of fun ways for them to think that, all right, yeah, this is a hard, fun, crazy workout. But when you're done, you don't even realize all the, you know, the, the hard work and the sweat and the effort that you put in because you did it with your brothers. You saw him, attacking and having fun and you saw a crazy light show and you know live animals which we've never done but you know who knows um <laughs> you know so it's just just it's all Brady about exotic Brady exotic yes <laughs> coming soon oh, never know I, I wouldn't never. put anything past you absolutely not I it was funny I did uh I did an Instagram live uh a week ago with one of my former bosses uh Rick Cord who I love and uh, he was like, yeah, he's like, what do you got next? So I was like, I don't know, maybe I'll have live animals. Well, sure enough, about five minutes later, Lawrence Metz texted me and said, I can't wait to see these live animals. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned your path and the people you've worked with. Take me through some of that and, and how you ended up at Ohio State, one, and then the relationship you built with, with Coach Pickle that ultimately led to you being one of his first additions when he got the job here. Yeah, so I think I think my passion for strength training really all probably my senior year of high school, just training in the weight room, uh, loving you know how 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 it worked for us physically, and also seeing it translate to the field, 
Um, obviously, when I got into college, it grew even more because now you're studying for it. You're learning about it. You know, I remember, you know, maybe my freshman year, you're in, you know, uh, sports, whatever. I mean, it turned out to be uh, a health promotion and sports science degree. But it was like at first I'm like, oh, maybe I'll do athletic training because I always knew I wanted to be in football or around football in some capacity. And then it just evolved because, you know, D3 programs, you don't have a strength coach. You know, you got your defensive coordinators watching the, the, the weight room while you're working out. So it really evolved my junior and senior year to me and a couple of our other captains, you know, right in the workouts. And, you know, our senior year, we were blessed. We went to the playoffs for the first time. And, you know, I think that was like the, the, the light coming on in my head, like, all right, this is what you're meant to do. So I did an internship at a local training facility uh, my junior year. And then my senior year, you had to do a, uh, another internship. And obviously being up there in Western Ohio, you're real close to Columbus. Um, so I got my foot in the door working with Ohio State. And it was mainly with Olympic sports, um, which I think at a young age for me was great because, you know, that was, you know, they're, they're training at 5 a.m., uh, training women's synchronized swimming, men's and, or men's and women's swimming and diving, uh, soccer, baseballs. And then you would help with football a little bit. And, you know, for me, I was like, all right, I know my passion is football. But it's great because I'm getting all this other experience of how to train a wide variety of student athletes. But it's like that's where your niche was known. All right, yes, it's football. So graduated. Um, and then, you know, I was like, all right, I got to get my foot in the door somewhere. So I remember clear as day just emailing every big program because, you know, I was a D3 guy. I'm like, I know if I'm going to, you know, get far in this business, I got to go big. So emailed a bunch of places, you know, got a, a lot of opportunities to come intern all those. and. Um, the University of Kentucky, I got into their master's department for kinesiology, which was a big deal because maybe some places I couldn't have gotten into. Who knows? I had good grades, but like, <laughs> you know, a deep education with student loans, nobody's going to, you know, GAs aren't really, you know, hard or they're, they're really hard to come by. So, and that was still kind of close to home, three hours away. My uh, wife, who, you know, at that time was just my girlfriend, she had another year of school, so that maybe played into it, but. You know, so it was, it was great. I go to K Kentucky, get my, you know, feet wet. Um, you know, I'm working a part-time job at finish line, helping out in the weight room. And then after that first season of 2009, um, Rich Brooks retires at Kentucky. Joker Phillips takes over, and he hires Ray Rock Oliver, who was an assistant at the Bengals, brings him down. And he brought uh, Ted Lambernitas, who is a local legend in Cincinnati, his family – helped start up Skyline Chili. Um, he used to own uh, ASAP training facilities around town, and he's just an unbelievable human being and uh, an extreme great friend to me. But And he came down as the assistant, and I'll never forget it. He, um, I come into the, to the weight room, and I meet Ray Rock, and he goes, you know, who the F are you? And I was like, um, you know, Brady Collins, I'm just an intern. Because nobody was there. I still remember this clear as day. The AD came down. I'm the only one in the weight room. I'm just an intern. And he said, hey, just make sure everything's okay for the next couple of days. I'm going, what? Because the previous staff got let go. There was no, you know, succession of what was about to come. And, uh, or no, that was different. But uh, so those guys come in. I'll, I'll get to that. Those guys come in. Who are you? I know. I'm getting all over the place. And I hand him my resume. And I still, to this day, and he even says it, the only reason he probably kept me was because it had Ohio State on there. And that's not pumping up Ohio State. It's only because those two guys graduated from Ohio State. Uh, Ted, my main mentor, he got his master's from Ohio State. He was on the strength staff when Mickey Marotti was a GA, when Ken Manny, who just retired at Michigan State, was a GA with uh, Nick Saban, with Pete Carroll. I mean, Earl Bruce, this guy's got stories that are just unbelievable. So those guys take me under their wing. Uh, I still, to this day, you know, everybody always messes with They're like, how does nothing really phase you? It's because my first boss, Ray Rock Oliver, absolutely, my head is forever cemented with craziness because of him. And I owe him so much for that. And then, you know, Ted really taught me the business side of it, the, per the personal relationship side of it, the, the sports science, all the science exercise physics that goes along with it. You know, not because again, we always say anybody can write a workout up. But it does it the progression is the same or you know appropriate and all that. Um, so that was great at a young age. Obviously, didn't do so hot there. Uh, but then an opening came up at Mississippi State. 
Um, the head strength coach at that time was Matt Bayless, who's now at Notre Dame. He called Ted, said, Ted, I got an opening. You know, do you have any recommendations? He said, Brady's your guy. He called me. I drove down that night, stayed for three days, got the job. Um, so, you know, living in Ohio my whole life, living in Lexington, Kentucky, then going to Starkville, Mississippi. That was a big change, but that was fun. Um, you know, so my first year there, just loving it. Everything's great. We go to the bowl game. We beat Rice and like the Liberty Bowl. And then uh, I'm back home in Columbus watching a basketball game with the Weiss family. I get a phone call from my boss said, hey, did you hear the news? I'm like, no, what's up? And I was like, you know, maybe it's Dan Mullen. Maybe he's, he took another job. That was like when Texas was open and all that stuff. He said, I'm, I'm you know, leaving. I'm going to UConn. And I was like, uh, what does that mean? So that was just another kind of gray area time. Uh, there were some other opportunities as assistants I turned down at that time because I wanted to stay there. Um, in comes Rick Court, who was an assistant at Ohio State. He got there when Coach Mick uh, and Coach Urban Meyer took over at Ohio State. And when he came down, it was like, you know, just like I always say it was like fireworks. Like, um, you know, he, he allowed me to coach, be who I am, uh, really taught me a lot of things, uh, ran a model very similar to kind of how, you know, Ohio State was structuring their things, but then put his twist on it to make it unique for Mississippi State. And just, you know, my, my level of expertise, my knowledge, just my passion grew even more and was fortunate to have a year and a half with him. And then it was, you know, literally, I think like right around my birthday in May, right before we're getting ready to start the summer training of the, of the Mississippi State is when uh, the Ohio State job came open. And obviously that was because Coach Court and Coach Mick were close. Um, you know, everybody I've always worked for had worked with or under Coach Mick. And it was just kind of like, you know, being a part of the tree. And, you know, went up for the interview, knocked the interview out, was blessed to get that job. That was great because I was home. You know, me and my wife were both from Columbus, Ohio. So that was great. Um, had, a, you know, obviously great two years there. But the best part about that job, obviously, was building the relationship with Coach Fick. And, you know, from day one, I know I've always said it, and it just sounds so cliche, but it's like when I describe Coach Fick, the first thing I think of is just an unbelievable human being. He's just he's a he's a man's man. He's a dude. That's our that's our favorite saying. Obviously, he's a is a dude. He's elite, um, but he's a great husband, a great father. No doubt, he's a great coach, great recruiter. But he's just he's a leader of men, and someone. You know, I'm only 33 right now, but you know, in our profession, it can be so crazy with just how coaches jump around or who you, you know, tag your, your hitch to and all that kind of stuff, who you're fortunate to go work with. For me, it's like I hit the home run because, you know, you want to be with someone that has the same philosophy, same views, same goals, same passions as you. And if anything, he increases mine. Uh, he challenges me. He makes me better. He, he, you know, entrusts myself and our staff to do the things that he needs done for his program. And, you know, for me, it's just – it's awesome going to work every day knowing you got one of the best, if not the best, just, you know, human beings, coach, like I said, all those things above in the world. When did he give you the, the heads up of I'm getting ready to take a job and you're coming with me? Like, at, at what point did you know that this was going to happen? So it was during uh, bowl prep for the uh, playoffs, you know, getting ready to go play Clemson, which that was not a good game. But uh, – <laughs> You know, I'm going into the meeting rooms. My, my position that I always made sure was stretched, hydrated, uh, you know, had the best relationships with was the linebacker room, hence why Coach Fick and I grew so close. And uh, I'm in there, you know, doing what I always do, putting up fun PowerPoints of the guys, playing loud music, getting all their drinks and snacks ready. And uh, he just, like, looked at me and he goes, hey, this, this thing's going to uh, be announced today. You coming? I was just like, hell yeah. I was like, yes, because, I mean – like, deep down, you know, you'd be lying if you said you don't see what's happening on Twitter. You don't hear some rumblings. But also, you know, it's not like you're going to go and knock on the door and be like, hey, coach, what, what do you think? <laughs> so it was, it was a really humbling and just an honor for him to even, you know, say that. And obviously, yeah, you know, ever since then, it's been go, go, go. The uh, I think the first – thing you guys basically did when when you got to Cincinnati in that January 2017 is the attention training yeah and you know I mean players who are around I know Chad's smile. heard of the bunch look at that smile <laughs> when he thinks about it <laughs> oh the yeah you said it he got that little grin that Brady grin 
I mean, anyone who was part of it, they, they talk about it. What is that? Was that a normal thing? Was that kind of a tone culture setting thing? And just kind of explain what exactly you did, because all Chad and I have ever heard are just horror stories from the players being out in the snow and running around outside and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it, looking back on it, you're like, man, that was that was that was crazy and it was unique. But that, you know, that's the whole the whole idea of what we were doing. It was, you know, we knew what we were coming into but we really didn't know what we had. So, you know, right away, what was the best way for us to evaluate one, their competitiveness, their toughness, uh, their love for one another. Because again, you're, you're coming in, you don't know these kids, they don't know you. You know, you want to see to those kids, one, you know, love and trust and respect each other because you're not the only one going through this. You got every, all your brothers too. And, you know, it was just, it was a tone center. It was, you know, we had to see what we had. We had to see where we needed to grow. Uh, obviously, they needed to see what we were kind of bringing, the, the, uh, the focus, the, the effort. Um, but, you know, it's funny because you look back on it now and you're just like, you know, yeah, all the guys still tell the stories. You know, if you're a, a freshman that comes in and you still got the Elijah Ponders around, the Curtis Brookses, those guys that kind of talk about it, like, man, they don't do that. That's, that's crap. And it's just like, you got to understand the team has evolved so much since that, that it's a good thing that you don't have to do that every year because obviously, yes, we did that. Then we went four and eight. Okay. And then we reevaluate everything. We're recruiting, we're developing. I mean, we're, we, we stay this all the time. We're in a state of perpetual development, which means if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, walk on scholarship, it doesn't matter. You're getting developed one way or another each and every single day, your mind, your heart, your body, everything. So, you know, even as a program, every year you're changing, you're adapting, you're evolving. And, you know, you don't always have to do those types of things. But, you know, looking back, it definitely did set the tone, I think, for a lot of things that we have accomplished here. Um, you know, it, it, it gave a mindset of, you know, this, this ain't going to be easy. Um, you know, Cincinnati football is going to be built, obviously, on toughness. But no doubt it's going to be built on real trust, love, and respect. You've obviously been some big places, Kentucky, Mississippi State, Ohio State. When did you and, and, and Fick and maybe all kind of these guys, the staff who's been together these four years, at what point, once you came to Cincinnati, did you realize everything you could do here, whether it was on the field, recruiting, um, just kind of the places you guys have taken this program since, since you got here, when did you realize that was a possibility? Oh, I think it's day one when you, when you accepted right. the you know, I mean, when Coach, no doubt Coach knew this was a place, he circled it, he wanted it, he got it. Um, you know, when he even asked you, like, and again, I know I've said it so many times, I didn't care if he went to the University of Alaska. I'm going just because of what it's going to be like to work with him. I know what it's going to be like to run the program we want to run with him in conjunction with how we coach our kids, how we love our kids, how we teach them, how we educate them, how we generally just care for them, not just what they do on the football field. And, you know, you get to a place like the University of Cincinnati that's had success in the past. So, you know, you can build on that. You look at the high school around, unbelievable high school. I mean, Ohio football is unbelievable, especially in Cincinnati. You know there's going to be great kids. You got to get those kids. How are you going to get them? It's the best, honest, real relationships you can because kids these days, yes, they're going to be enamored with brand new facilities and shiny locker rooms and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. Just like I said, we've evolved with our workouts that we're sending the kids, why they know how to do it, because we didn't have all the equipment when we first got here. We've trained in five different areas since I've been the head strength coach here. That's crazy. I'm going to write a book about it. Um, because, again, it's always it's always not what – it's not, it's not really not what you have and where you're doing it. It's who and the why. And that's, that's how the coach – it's the what and the whys. It's the hows. Like, hey, you got – you got to cover, man, you know, curl to flat. Okay, yeah, you could say that, but teach me how. Teach me the why so I understand it. And, uh, you know, just been so blessed that obviously through the years, recruiting great people, developing the ones that we've uh, had on the roster, and just, you know, bringing great group of um, coaches around and support staff. And, you know, it's, uh, it is. It's always been a special place. I mean, growing up in Columbus, Ohio, I knew this place was special. And, um, you know, the old NCAA video game, I still to this day remember one of my favorite dynasties I ever did was with Cincinnati because I love their all black people. <laughs> Brady, everybody thinks of strength and conditioning as 
what happens with the current roster. I don't think people realize how vital you guys also are in the recruiting process when kids get to campus. Uh, they want to find out who their strength and conditioning coach is. They want to see the facilities. They want to, you know, kind of find out what that experience is going to be like when they get to college. What's your approach to that? How do you guys handle it? And, and how are you able to make an impact not only with the team, but, but as their recruiting prospects as well? Yeah, and I think, uh, I think it all starts, obviously, at the top. I mean, Coach Fick knows how valuable and how important our strength program is to the success on the field and even off the field because the lessons that we preach and that we coach in the weight room, they're going to show up in life. Like I always tell our recruits, I tell them straight up, I said, here's our philosophy. We're not, you know, yes, we're high intense. Uh, you know, we do ground-based functional, all these kinds of crazy things. I said, I'm going to back you into a corner. And I'm going to see if you're going to stay there or fight your way out because that's what life's going to do. Life's going to throw bills at you. It's going to throw job responsibility, family, all these obligations. They can weigh heavy on your shoulders and kind of tear you down, or you can stick your chest out and attack it one by one and overcome those things. So I, I'm as honest as I can be, just like every coach is when they're recruiting. I'm not going to tell these kids, hey, I'm going to make you run a 4-4. I'm going to get you to a 400-pound bench because I wish I could. I'm not. God, I can't touch these kids and bless them with all these magical things. My number one thing I got to do is maximize their genetic potential. And I've said it so many times, the kids are going to come in from all different types of high school backgrounds. You might've had a great training program like Blake Basevich from uh, St. X up the road. You know, you might come from a school that had absolutely nothing. Coach, we had a dumbbell rack and, you know, two squat racks. So they might not know anything. You got to treat everybody the same and you got to gradually coach them, educate them, don't just throw them under bars to see how much they can squat if they can't even bend. Um, Cause it's all about, yes, I said, maximizing genetic potential, but staying healthy. That's the most important thing. They're, they're going to be no good to us if I'm a 400 pound bencher, but I can't even practice two practices because my chest hurts or I'm overdoing it and stuff like that. So uh, it's a, it's, you know, I, I love talking to recruits because it's not recruiting. It's building that relationship. Like when it, to this day, I still remember, you know, Malik Van, I talked to him through, you know, Twitter contact, just, you know, hey, man, what are you watching on Netflix? Uh, you know, how's your family doing? This and that. And then, you know, it's not fake. It's not just me just saying it to say it. Like, I generally want to know because now when he steps on campus, you know, I can tell when something's going on with him. I can sense that something's not right that day. And I can motivate him differently than I need to motivate others. So, you know, it's a unique process. Um, obviously, everybody loves him and after pictures and all that stuff and that's great and I show that and I show the fun that we have the squat fest and how much we love and take care of them but you know no doubt I tell them straight up if you do not want to work hard then this isn't the place for you because you know like coach Vic always says the world will lie to you it'll lie to you it's not all sunshine and rainbows but if you put in the work if you're willing to sacrifice yourself for something bigger than yourself the team your brothers then together you're going to accomplish big things you mentioned genetic disposition. Uh, <laughs> tell me what it's like working with a James Wiggins, a, a Charles McClellan, guys that are in the, the top 0.1% of uh, being blessed genetically. I'll, I'll tell you this. They make your job a lot easier. That is for sure. Um, no, those guys, you know, they're very, very hard to come by, but they're out there and the coaches do a great job of continuing to bring in you know, high level recruits, but not even just the ratings and all that stuff. It's just the type of kids they are, um, their family background, their, you know, yes, their genetic makeup makes it a lot easier for us to tack on the muscle and, you know, get them bigger, faster, and stronger and all that. But when they have the right heart and the mindset and the work ethic for it, that's when they really take off. But, you know, those guys definitely, I mean, they're, they're a special breed to coach. Um, and, you know, it's always unique because you can get so caught up and a James Wiggins and a Charles McClellan, and then you might lose sight in some other guys when really those guys are going to be fine. They're going to do their work. They're going to keep growing. They're going to maintain all their things and get faster and stronger and all that stuff. How are you going to impact everybody else while knowing these guys are going to be the guys that are going to be, you know, the show showrunners for everybody? Um, you know, because even a high caliber guy such as Wiggins, I got to pry him as much as anybody because some things are so easy for him because he's so genetically gifted that I got to find different ways to motivate him and challenge him even more. Um, but no doubt you love, you love getting those guys that come in. 
uh, that are all twitched up, that are, you know, going to easily pack the weight like a Charles McClellan who put on 30 pounds. Um, but no, I love the projects. Um, you know, those guys, well, Lawrence Metz, I mean, he came in 278 pounds. He texts me today, he's 332 pounds. I mean, and he still has a six pack. He looks great. He can bend, you know, and um, you just, you love seeing those guys continue to grow, um, not just physically, but more so mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all those things. Coach, now admit it. You guys, you didn't like James Wiggins at first. You thought he smiled too much. You thought he was I did. Too happy. <laughs> I did. I've always said that. He knows that too. I used to call him Smiley. Um, and it's, you know, again, I think that's, that's a big evolution of what we've done and what we've been, you know, so blessed to build with our guys is, you know, that trust and that respect that we talk about, that genuine love and care for one another. Because, again, we demand so much. We're asking so much. If we're not giving back. If I truly don't understand what makes James Wiggins tick and his background and this and that, it's just going to be this the whole time. And you're never really going to connect to not his muscles, but to his heart, which is where he's really going to grow. So, you know, I think that was all about just getting to know people, like building that relationship. Wiggs was a special human being already. He smiled. I didn't like that at first, no doubt. But how was he smiling? <laughs> he was smiling because it was easy. And the stuff that we do isn't easy, but he might, you know, take a shortcut here. And, oh, it's real easy. I, I could get 13 reps of this, but I'm going to do four. And it's like, no, 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 you keep going. Like, push your heart, push your mind to that, that point and break. But, uh, you know, that can't happen unless he has that trust and respect in you as a coach because, you know, that's, that's when, you know, programs really take off. And, you know, again, we're, we're fortunate that that's happened with a lot of kids besides Mr. Smiley. <laughs> you uh, talking about the recruiting and, and how good the local high school football is. Kind of one benefit you guys have there is you're allowed to have some of these recruits once they sign, they can come work out you know, with you guys if you want to. And I realize, you, you know, there's only certain things you can do, but, you know, you've talked to us about David Jones, uh, Jaheim Thomas, oh, yeah. Deshaun Pace. Those are guys in January who are getting up at five in the morning to come work out before high school. You know, first of all, that speaks to the recruits you get, but I think it also speaks to the, the culture you guys have already established that before they even get there, they just want to come and, and, and work out and try and get a head start. It is. I mean, it's, I mean, if you would have told me when I was a high school senior and I just got done with my season and I got, you know, I got winter and spring, I'm either working out, I'm playing basketball, I'm doing whatever. Okay, you know, you're going to go to the college that you're about to go to and you're going to work out in the environment you're going to work out. Yeah, I'll do that. And, uh, I mean, that's a huge testament to those kids, their families, the way they were raised. Those guys were getting up at 5.30 in the morning, getting to the facility before anybody was in there because they can't work out when our guys are in there. And they were working out, learning uh, the workouts that we're doing with the guys, pretty much like they would if they got here in June. But they are able to jumpstart their progression months ahead. So, yeah, it's a huge advantage. I mean, it all started with, you know, the uh, Blake Basevich, the Josh Wileys, the, the Hicksies. And then it's just evolved every single year. Actually, the first one was Jarrell White when we first got there. And uh, it's huge. I mean, that's a huge testament because, you know, now those guys learn everything. They're growing. I mean, Dave Jones and Jaheim Thomas, they were like 225 pounds, and they're huge human beings. And, you know, now they know and understand the workouts and our culture and all those things. So they're with their whole class. Uh, in the summer, they're going to have a jump start on those guys. And it, it doesn't mean those guys are going to be left behind. It just means now those guys are going to be the leaders of their group to show them the exercises, to say, hey, man, I've done this. We learned this. Now they're an extension of us as a staff, and it's just going to help smooth everything on. All right. I want to jump back a couple months. Uh, the Birmingham Bowl down in Alabama. Wild scene. There's this big storm. It, you know, delays the game an hour, you know, whatever it was. Maybe one team a little bit more excited to get back out and play than the other. Um, who knows? But <laughs> after the game – Des and Fick are sitting in the little interview table and we were asking what were you guys doing during that time and Des was like well Brady you know coach Collins had us kind of doing some stretches and and then it actually got a little bit crazy and turned into like a, a, a mosh pit scene and like the look on Fick's face thinking back on it take us back walk us through <laughs> how the word months removed what actually happened in that little break before you guys went back out there yeah I mean so again very similar situation we're now you know you go in 
you have no idea how long it's going to be. You know, the first lightning strike, they're like, all right, it's 30 minutes. And then another one came, it's like 30 minutes more. So we, again, it all goes back to having a great plan. And uh, my staff did a great job working with, you know, DFO, John Whittakin, and making sure we had extra snacks and extra food beforehand because, you know, we're tracking the weather too. We're, we're aware of what could happen. So we, we felt good there. We're like, all right, we got subs. We got plenty of food. All of our snacks that we normally have at halftime and all that, we're good there. And then it was just to the point, okay, now these kids are sitting in their lockers. Some of them are soaking wet. Um, you know, you don't know how much time you're going to have when you get back on the field to go warm up. And when that actually possibility came into play, and, you know, coach is talking, he's like, how much time do these guys need? Well, after what we did, and I'll get to it, I was like, coach, we're ready to go right now. And, you know, basically, again, just like in the weight room, just like in a pregame, just like in the locker room, music, as loud as you can, right? Guys are vibing to it. They're getting hyped up. Some guys might have their own stuff on. It's fine. So we're playing fun music. Guys are getting up. Um, we start getting them together in position groups, kind of doing our own stretches with them, my staff and I. And then we got the whole team together once we knew we were about to go play. And, it, you know, everybody was just in there just, you know, let's go, let us out, let us out. Like, our team was so jacked up to play that game. It was probably one of the most juiced up teams I've ever seen in my life to go win. And I knew from the moment that we landed in Birmingham, from the moment we started practicing, that we were going to win the game just because of our guys' mentality to go attack, everything that they always do hiding from us. But so the music gets cranked up even more. I started getting the whole team around, doing some stretches. And then, you know, it just turns into, like, a couple guys starting to mimic me when I do the stretch. So you know, I'd be like, straight leg out. The guys are like saying it, straight leg out and doing my thing and doing my voice. And then I'd hit the whistle and then everybody would say something, the next one. And then I'd hit the whistle and everybody would do the next one. And everybody's just kind of dancing, vibing with the music. And it, it just, I'm just blowing a whistle. Everybody else is yelling the commands and the stretches. And then we hit a song and my staff and I would just kind of started attacking guys and having fun and just throwing stuff. And then it was just like, <laughs> Coach, Coach Vic got a break and like, all right, sorry, BC, you're going down. <laughs> I, I've got some good questions. I, I the, the members of Bearcat Journal have some questions for you that I wanted to ask as well. Uh, I think here's the best one. What's more important, the conditioning or the nutrition? I mean, they go hand in hand um, because you can't condition, you can't strength train if you don't have the proper nutrition, the proper recovery, the proper rest in your body. I say it all the time. And again, it's so hard because guess what? We were on college. We all stayed up late and you got three to four hours of sleep and then you woke up and went and attacked the day. You can do that at a young age, but is that really going to be the most beneficial for you? No. Again, we always tell our kids, there's going to be things you got to sacrifice in order to be really great, whether it's time, whether it's relationships, whether it's substances, you know, are you putting good things in your bodies? Are you not? And, you know, if you want to be an elite player, if you want to go to that next level, if you want to be the best you can be at Cincinnati, you're going to have to do some of those things. So, you know, I, I always even tell the kids, I'm like, as much as I love seeing everybody jacked up, yeah, muscles really don't grow in the, the weight room. They grow when you recover. They grow when you eat. So, again, I'm fortunate. My staff, they do a great job working with our guys, with nutritionists, making sure, you know, there's individualized plans. You know, just because we're all linebackers doesn't mean we all need the same shake. One, I might like chocolate better than you like strawberry, but – also, I need more protein than you do. You need more carbs. You might need less of this. So, you know, it, it is. It's a fine line of kind of fine-tuning and individualized plans for each guy to get them where they want to be. Because, again, not everybody can be a Charles McClellan that comes in 160 pounds and all of a sudden puts on 30 pounds and he's 190. It's all about your genetic makeup. What God blessed you with, we're just going to enhance it and grow. And some guys can grow really, really big. Some guys are going to stay right around what they came in at. And that's like when, when my Jay got here and you oh. made him eat two plates of everything. Yeah. Tell me that story. That's a good one. Uh, so, you know, my coming from down there in Jacksonville, Florida. He loved like a couple things. He loved ribs. He loved some seafood. And I think that's really about it. I mean, I still remember his recruiting dinner at uh, Montgomery Inn and he ate like, I don't even know how many slabs of ribs. I just put <laughs> in the I don't think, all right, this guy will eat the meat. And he, you know, he was 195 pounds soaking wet on his visit. And uh, when he finally got to us, you know, a couple weeks before camp, his freshman year, he was 208. And again, you just looked at his frame. You know, Aaron uh, Himmler in the training room, they do an unbelievable job 
of our pre-screen and evaluation period that we do with all of our guys. Because again, yeah, I'm, I'm Maji Sanders. I come in, I'm six, four and a half. I'm 208. Okay. And then you look at his arms. His arms are almost touching the ground. His shoulders are broad. He's just really skinny. Okay. Let's check his eating habits. Let's check his blood work, all these things. Okay. Everything lines up. But all right. Here's it. Eat and train as hard as you can because you're not going to be fat. You're going to put on good weight and watch what happens to you as a football player. So he's been a guy that definitely attacks everything that he does. Um, he's a great kid, man. Does he love football? Does he love training? Um, you know, he's a guy that his ceiling is so high. I mean, he's still right here. He hadn't even begun to even come close to it. So, you know, really, really looking forward to see what he can do. But, you know, some guys, they just don't, they don't understand how much they can really eat or how much they have to eat in order to even maintain. You know, you, you go through any workout, you're going to lose 800 to 1500 calories. And again, everybody's different. I might lose more, you might lose less. And that's just all about working with them individually to find the best. Well, that was that was higher ground, right, though? That, that every time he went yeah. to the line, you know, yes. get two plates of everything. That's the higher ground's the best because of the food is unlimited. So, and, you know, during, uh, during camp, you know, obviously you're going to have some weight fluctuations because of the heat, just because of practices and all that stuff. But again, we're so blessed as a program to have that place because there's no shortage of food. And those guys can eat all day long as much as they want. We're tracking their weights and seeing it. And again, it's the same thing. If I'm Maji and I just practice my butt off and I'm tired and I got to go try to eat a little bit of lunch and I'm going to take a nap and then I got to get up for meetings and this and that. No, 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 no. Sit down, catch your breath. Trust me, your body needs this. You might not want it right now, but you need it. <laughs> okay. How much, I know there's still all the un uncertainty kind of with schedule and things like that, but it seems like everybody we've talked to, you know, whether it's at spring practice or, you know, stuff that was going on over the winter, the fact that Fick obviously had some opportunities, he could have gone somewhere else, he chose to stay here. The sense it seems like everyone just feels like this could be a really special season in, in 2020 for the program, for the team. From your point of view, whether that's, just being around the team or even from a kind of a strength and conditioning point of view, what are you seeing? Oh, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I'd be lying to you if I said when all that stuff was going on, like deep down, I was like, nah, man, like, you know, yes, everything's always exciting. And to me, it's so, it's so great because I'm so happy for coach that he gets that notoriety. He gets that, um, you know, respect from the outside world and all that stuff, because again, he works his ass off so hard. This whole program does that, you know, in order to get some national attention, it's going to take a little bit of that. Obviously, the product on the field is doing that as well, which is what we ultimately want. But, you know, deep down, I'd be lying if I said, man, my heart was going to break to not see Derek Forrest and Kobe Bryant and Jarrell White. And, you know, these guys that came in with you as, as puppies and have groomed and just grown and developed to not be there for their last year. So I'm so happy and so fortunate that we are still here. Um, I agree with everything that coach always says. I mean, Cincinnati is special. This team is special. Uh, the facilities, all those things, those are going to continue to involve like, like weight rooms and all those. That's great. It's the people that you have, the people that you go to work with every single day. That is what ultimately makes your job the utmost, just fun, enjoyable. Um, so honored and blessed, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unique. It is, you know, every year you've gotten a little bit better every year you've made twitches. Um, you get new guys in, guys develop, guys, you know, change, guys leave, whatever it may be. And it's just, it's a big puzzle piece that you got to put together. But, you know, it's funny because you planted those roots, you know, four years ago. And those roots have grown and grown and grown. And now, you know, they're blossomed. And some are ready to really excel. Some are still growing, all that stuff. But it's, it is, it's really rewarding to see those guys, um, all the hard work and the effort and the commitment that they've put into not just, you know, this program, but to each other themselves as a brotherhood. Um, so you could tell, yeah, you could definitely tell there's something special. I'm a heavy, heavy, optimistic person. I think we're going to win every single game. I know we're going to win every single game. We're going to be bigger, stronger, faster, or more tough, all those things. But uh, you can definitely sense something really special about uh, this upcoming year. You uh, you talked about my guy. There any, I think somebody asked this on the board, Chad. Who are the other, like, whether they're projects or just guys who you feel like have grown crazy in the weight room the time over the time you've had them? Oh, boy, let's see. I mean, you know, I mean, one that always sticks out, people don't realize this, is when we first got here, Marcus Brown 
weighed 354 pounds. He was massive. 300. I still show, I show him every offseason. I'm like, look what you came from, man. You know, now he, he sent me a picture today. It was 297. It was 295 the other day. Two, he, you know, he'll FaceTime, take a picture of the scale of that. And you're just so happy for him because, why? Well, one, he's healthier and he's playing better football. He did real good last year. We're going to count on him big time this year. But, you know, that's a huge change that nobody ever sees. Um, I mentioned the Charles. I mentioned, you know, guys like Dez, everybody knows about that. has grown in height and in weight, but still needs to grow even more in weight. Um, you know, Ben Bryant's put on almost 30 pounds. Um, you know, obviously there's the, the Lawrence Mets. People don't realize it because he's so skinny anyways. He looks like, you know, a tarantula. But uh, Ahmad, I will call him Sauce Gardner, <laughs> you know, he was like 150-some pounds soaking wet. Now he's 181. You know, we got to get him up to 190 because um, his frame can hold it. He's a big guy. You know, they're, they're all over. They're everywhere. I mean, Dorian Holloway, 190-some pounds to 230. Um, Isaiah Ruffin, another kid, he's put on like 50 pounds. Um, so they're out there. I mean, it's just, again, it's all about their genetic potential and, and real lean mass, not just crappy weight, you know. Well, I guess that even another one I could – I mean, Vinny McConnell, when, when Vinny first got on campus, he was like 255, you know. So Vinny played all of last year about 290. Again, we're, we're hoping to get Vinny up to 300. You know, he's, he's probably the most athletic lineman. He's smart. He's strong. He's fast. I mean, that's exactly what you want in an lineman. So he's versatile. He can play outside, inside. Um, but they're everywhere. And he knows, all, he knows karate too. He does know karate. He went down in our <laughs> – <laughs> he, he did. Coach, um, looking ahead, I know there's a lot of uncertainty. Nobody still has any idea what exactly is going to happen. From your perspective, how much time are you going to need to get guys ready for a season uh, after what is we're looking at potentially three, four, five month layoff uh, without being you know actually in your care how long is it going to take think, i mean it's it's that's a great question again you know even coach said it the other day you know back in the day they used to and again i played d3 and i think uh another coach i think matt campbell just came out with a you know a similar quote saying you know in the summers yeah you went home you did your workouts and then you showed up back for camp and then you attacked and went yeah back in the day that's what it was like in college you you know, you had a, a summer job, you did training on your own, and then you showed up for camp and you went. Now, obviously, the times have changed. College football is so massive and a year-round ordeal. Um, and it is so important that we're around our guys so much for that, uh, you know, physical development, but also the mental and the social and the spiritual, all those things that go into it. Um, I feel really confident. And if we had six weeks, I feel really great with that. Because, again, you got to evolve – everything around what is about to happen again we still don't know you know hopefully america keeps doing great ohio's doing really good and you know you get through and all right you know middle of may end of may they say you could start doing some things in june or what whatever it may be we're going to have the best plan that's going to put our program and our kids in the best position to do everything that we set out to do this year which is to go win a championship and again i think it all goes back to that mindset of the the culture and the environment that you have inside that locker room this is where it's really going to show because, you know, kids can, they can lie to their teammates. They can lie to their coaches or cut corners, all that stuff. When they look in the mirror, you can't lie to that person. So if you put in that work, if you put in that effort and did what you're supposed to do to get better, not only for yourself, but for the team, you're going to know that. And, uh, you know, we'll have a great plan either way. If, if the workouts got to continue for another month or two months, you know, I feel so again, blessed my staff. We've been working on things. I've been working on it all morning. I know my wife wants to probably wring my head because I haven't helped as much, but, you know, we're putting together an exercise database for, uh, you know, the, the incoming signees and even our guys just to have on file. So, you know, we set, we were able to send out bands to guys that didn't have any equipment. Um, so now, okay, now instead of just doing push-ups or a backpack push-up or whatnot, now I got the bands. Well, that's great because we've trained with the bands in the weight room. We know how to do those. But now there's just a video with it to kind of help you with it and progress it. And uh, it really is. It's all about just having a great plan. Whatever it is, whatever the timeline they give us, trust me. Who's going to complain? Because, like I said, everybody's in the same situation. 
I could be the worst strength coach in the world and complain and moan about, oh, I need more time, this and that. My job is to physically and mentally prepare these kids for the violent rigors of the greatest sport in the world. And again, we're blessed to have Aaron in the training room and his staff with Michelle and everybody, our PTs, um, to, to have a good plan in correlation with us. I mean, I know it. We're not going to overdo it. We're not going to come back. And, you know, we got a certain amount of time. We're going to start heavy benching and squatting and all these things. We got to, you know, fine tune some things and realize that the ultimate goal, and it never changes anyways when we do an off season, is to prepare them to play football. Um, the, the question I get most before, I, before we let you go, uh, can you come up with a, with a nutrition plan for the members of Bearcat Journal? They, 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 they want you to help them out but they still want to do it while eating tacos and drinking beer. Oh, uh, that's two of my favorites right there. Mexican. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the biggest thing, obviously, is getting a routine. I mean, that's, to me, that's been one of the hardest things during this process is, you know, sticking in your routine. So, you know, when spring break ended, what's my normal routine? I'm up at four. I get to the office. You know, I start my day, get all that stuff rolling. It's a little different here now because – you know, you got the kids and you're trying to help and you're trying to, you know, enjoy that time that you're not going to ever have again with your little kids and trying to do a little too much. But you also, you know, you got to stick to your routine. So I'm trying to get up, you know, the same time I do, get down here, work out, get into the office upstairs, do some work, connect with my guys, reach out to all of our guys, talking to them. Um, but I would say routine is great. Try to Try to go to the bed at the same time. That's hard. Try to get up at the same time. Uh, drink lots of water. <laughs> Lots of water is good. Um, no fried food. That's tough. But if, if you're going to have fried food, you can you know have them once a week or something. Um, increase your veggies, fruit. But uh, there's nothing wrong with having a, a, a cold beer. <laughs> are, are you telling me you're still waking up at 4 a.m.? Every now and then, yes. I do. I do. Why? It's the only time the I have. The not up. Yeah. <laughs> You come stay at our house. You see what time my daughter's up at. She'll jump on my chest if I'm not up at like five, <laughs> five, five thirty. Oh yeah. You you got to train them, get the kids to sleep in. If they know you're up at four, they're trying to get up to hang out with dad. You got to train them <laughs> Bro, to sleep in a little bit. My wife loves to get up early too, and even she says now she's like, I can't even get up uh, to have my alone time because the kids are up so early now. <laughs> you got one more for him, Justin, before we let him go. No, I mean, you said a, a cold beer every once in a while, like just, just one? If you're of age, obviously. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, there's so many, you know, great things that – and here's my greatest thing. One of the biggest reasons I work out now is because I love food. Food was put on this earth to enjoy. I learned that from my first mentor, Ted. And, uh, you know, he's like a food connoisseur. He travels the country, does a lot of things for the NCAA and the NFL. And he's, you know, he's the go-to food guy. But, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with a, a, a nice cold cold one if you're having it playing safely. But definitely you got you to gotta work out, though. You can't just be, you know, can't just be sitting around at your desk and stuff. You got to do something physical activity. That, that I've been drinking like water. This cup is heavy. I've been drinking water out of this cup. It's like that a 12-ounce last... curl. It's like a 12-ounce curl. Right. That last line Keep seemed directed at us, Jed. That's right. <laughs> grab, grab your dog, grab your daughter, do some squats, some overhead presses. So I, I've got a 25-pound puppy that doesn't like going up or down stairs yet, so I carry him a lot now. So there I am go. increasing my activity. Yes, you are. There you go. And we go on walks. <laughs> See? Walks are good, right? Walks is real good. I think, you know, if, uh, like I said, during this kind of quarantine thing where everybody's a, a fitness guru, but it really is promoting, you know, getting out because nobody wants to be in the house all day and the weather has been really nice. So, I mean, a, a, a nice walk can do wonders for, you know, your, your mental and physical health for sure. I, I, there was a video that went around the other day that was a guy that uh, he kept telling his wife he was going for walks and he had oh. found a, a blind spot in the house and he would pull out the, the lawn chair and a cooler and sit there in the blind spot and, and drink while she thought he was out for a walk. That's, that's, that's my great. style. That's, my style. <laughs> that's a smart move right there. That's a smart you gotta move. Walk, you got to walk to get to the blind spot. So, 
kind of counts. That is. All that right, is. man. Thanks a lot, Brady. Uh, very good stuff, and uh, always fun to talk to you. And can't wait until we're hanging out before practice and uh, chatting it up, uh, trying to get this season started. Looking forward to it. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brady. Thank you, guys. Take care. I'm Chad Brendel. That's Justin Williams from The Athletic. That's UC Strength and Conditioning Coordinator and Director of Strength and Conditioning, Brady Collins. Thanks to everybody for listening in. We'll see you next time. Luke Fickle next week. Oh, big time. Big time. And then another big time one next week. You'll like this one, Brady. Jake Sosko. Oh, the man. Yeah, that, <laughs> one's, gonna be, that one's gonna be a good one. So we'll see you next time. It's the BCJ podcast brought to you by the Holy Grail right here on BearcatJournal.com. <laughs>